I love 101 Dalmatians. And to that you might ask, I which one? There's a few pieces of media that go by 101 Dalmatians. Yes, that's my answer. Everything there is that's 101 Dalmatians related, I love. And that's no exaggeration. Of course, there's the original Disney film based on the children's book by Dodie Smith, which is an all-time classic and one of my personal favorites. If you don't know the story, the Dalmatians of a musician and his wife have a litter of 15 puppies that are subsequently stolen by a fur says fashionista, Cruella de Vil, who intends on turning them and 84 other puppies into a set of fur coats, causing the parents to go off to save them before it's too late. Yeah, it was honestly a pretty dark concept when you thought about it for even a second, and the crew behind the film definitely knew that. Taking the opportunity to make one of my favorite Disney villains of all time with Cruella, who's gaudy and ruthless and egotistical in all the best ways. I mean, she's literally named Cruella de Vil. It'd be hard for her not to be. She really mixed well with the setting and atmosphere to come off as a more humanized, old-timey cartoon character, leading to several iconic scenes. And speaking of style, 101 Dalmatians has loads of it bursting out of the old London setting and through all its characters, whether they're the owners Roger and Anita, the main dogs Pongo and Purdy, or even the side villains Jasper and Horace. They all add a lot to the film, gotta be one of the most memorable Disney casts in my opinion, and even more littered across the film to keep it interesting. By the end, when all is said and done, the puppies are saved and the family all live happily on a Dalmatian plantation after Roger's career takes off, but it wouldn't be the last time we saw from the Dalmatians or Cruella by a long shot. I could go on for days about all the media 101 Dalmatians has had since the 60s film. One of the few good Disney direct-to-video sequels, one of the original Disney live-action remakes before they were all terrible and added nothing, a fun cartoon made on the cusp of the new millennium, and Cruella doesn't count. I only saw a few Dalmatians in that shit, no wonder they changed the name. They had to avoid false advertising. But you know, even if it is Cruella, I gotta give all the interpretations this. Not one of them doesn't have a specific voice. Whether it was different main leads, different settings, different art, whatever, something impressive about every 101 Dalmatians series is their ability to transform the property while retaining most of the same magic that the original film had, being reminiscent and distinguishable at the same time. Besides Cruella, how many times do I gotta say it doesn't count? It doesn't, it doesn't, it never fu- But there's one bit of 101 a lot more its own thing than any movie or series before it, one I'm sure you haven't heard of when you should have, a series currently consisting of 26 episodes that aired in various regions of the world from 2019 to 2021. A series that got buried and buried to the point almost no one saw it, a series, I think, was at least partially set up to fail. So let me tell you about 101 Dalmatian Street. To get to the show itself, I gotta provide the background for why you don't know about it, and that goes back to Disney TVA themselves, the people tasked with getting the show out there in the first place. And and look, I already know what some of you might be thinking. Why would a company ever make a product just so it could fail? That doesn't make any sense. And you'd be right if we were talking in terms of physical property, but this is the entertainment industry. And in TV, they go by another standard entirely. Viewership is money, and if the viewers ain't viewing, the money ain't money in. And so a lot of the time, a series will get fully produced and made to air on a studio, and they'll decide it isn't worth giving up the space. So after that, there are a few ways to kill the show without hurting your margins. You could put it in an early or late time slot that no one's using so you don't take away from the main stuff, you could keep from spending money on an advertising budget so no one knows when it's coming out. Anything to run out the contract for airing and get it off as soon as possible. And then there's the last resort. Something that makes me angry just saying the words. Moving it to a paid channel. If you've watched cartoons in the past 20 years, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. Because other than networks like PBS that can't spare to dump their show somewhere else, pretty much every major cartoon channel has one. Your Boomerangs, your Nicktoons networks, and of course, your Disney XDs. They're all paid channels, meaning that in a basic case, cable package, they don't exist. You gotta pay extra to see them, which means way more people didn't have them because their parents aren't paying that damn money. They've already got cartoons on plenty of channels, and therein lies the tragedy. Look at viewer numbers for any of these paid networks compared to the main ones. It's night and day. Having a series of viewers made a Disney XD or whatever exclusive or taken from the main network to the paid can only mean one thing. The network is shafting you in the most legit way they can. And in the dying world of television, where getting a few million views is considered impressive these days, it's only gotten worse and worse over at the paid channels. The issue has gone on so long and gotten so big, I've thought about making a mini-series in the future dedicated to looking at all the shows shafted over the years from each network. And 101 Dalmatian Street was the spark to set my flames going off in every direction. At the start, Dalmatian Street was broadcast on Disney Channel UK, though slightly delayed from its planned air date, to which it ran its course, and I'm not from the UK, but in the few posts I've seen talking about it, Disney didn't advertise it much there either. Shocker. But anyway, after the initial release in the UK, the series was meant 
to be shown all over the world across Disney channels in 2019 or 2020, but around that time, streaming had become majorly popular, so Disney decided the best course of action would be to put the series directly onto Disney+, Plus, which they did without any marketing before or after. Dalmatian Street was released to almost no fanfare, cause the fans weren't told that it came out, and none until over a year later did Disney finally syndicate it at all on Disney XD, where it ran out the clock over the course of six months, ended, and so far hasn't been renewed for a second season because of poor ratings on both the channel and Disney+. Plus. And I have looked at those ratings. They're godly in how bad they are. For reference here, cartoons on Disney Channel average around three to 400,000 viewers every new episode. It's a far cry from a few years ago, and the number is only dropping, but that's the regular standard we're working with here. At best, Dalmatian Street got 100,000 viewers. At worst, 30,000. You heard that right. 30,000 viewers. That's how low the range was for this show's audience, and undoubtedly, it is all Disney's fault. The way they handled the show couldn't be described as any less than terribly. It got everything thrown at it. Late time slot, no advertising, shifting around dates for when it would show up, delays, all merch being kept in Europe, and being moved to a paid network. They pretty much actively tried to get the series to fail, and I have no idea why. From what I've heard, there is still like the smallest possibility of it getting renewed for a second season if the Disney Plus numbers go up, and while I think it's almost impossible that a sequel season will come, I'm still gonna tell you why I feel like it should have one, and why you should watch what's out. I don't know, I'm an idiot and a pessimistic optimist when it comes to these things, so who knows, but I'm gonna give the show the chance Disney never did. This is 101 Dalmatian Street. A series worth talking about. Something to immediately note going into the series is that the showrunners made it a goal to never watch any media relating to 101 other than the original film, and that might sound like a weird move, or potentially even a detrimental one, but as mentioned, every piece of 101 Dalmatians media is radically differentiated from the last. And for the most part, they stay unconnected, so not watching everything done with the franchise isn't as odd a choice as it might sound. It wasn't done from laziness or impotence either, like the worst video game adaptations in recent years, but instead for the series' benefit. The showrunners wanted to make it so the series felt like a direct continuation of the original property with no interventions from anything else to potentially muddle its accessibility or appeal. They also didn't want to come off as taking ideas from places they either didn't want to or didn't mean to, and I think they did a phenomenal job since the lack of reference material led to a really different series from the last show. For example, in the 90s cartoon, Cruella is a major recurring villain, and that's kind of odd because she interacts with Roger and Anita like she didn't just try to kill all their pets after having some goons kidnap them, and with this show setting, it'd be obvious that she wouldn't be nearly as prominent. Though, that isn't to say that she isn't there at all. <laughs> Foreshadowing, potentially. Similarly, for continuity, in the 90s show, they lived on a farm in America, which is pretty weird when the original is set in the UK, and Dalmatian Street fixes that discrepancy by setting the cast in Camden Town, London, a very specific location that draws on a lot of the iconography from the real place it's based on. And don't get me wrong, the original cartoon still has a unique setting, I'll take anything that isn't basic-ass suburbia or bland generic cityscape, but I have a certain preference for really specific locations over equally generic templates like farm. And Dalmatian Street has another factor that makes it more unique than all the other iterations before it. The series doesn't focus on the main cast from the first film. Wait, Braxton, hold on a second. How can there be a series about 101 Dalmatians when the main Dalmatians themselves aren't even in it? The live-action one followed the same characters, the sequel followed a named character from the original, the first cartoon followed named characters from the original. Why would they get rid of the main cast that made them who they are? The show's probably just using the name for branding! Well, first of all, let's get something straight here. These characters are still related to the originals. Since the show is set 60 years after the events of the original film, it would only make sense that the story would focus on their Descendants, and I think both those ideas are great in the grand scheme of things. Like I said, the newer specific setting is a breath of fresh air for both the franchise and cartoons in general. Plus, I think it's able to retain the style of the first film while making it modernized. Like, they changed the Twilight Bark, a gossip chain in the first film, into the World Wide Wolf, where it serves nearly the same purpose, but also has a more internet vibe to its usage. Also, I just thought the name change was clever. Little additions like that are so charming. And back to my point about the complete character change, you can say the show isn't complete without the main cast from the original, but if you look at any subsequent media that came out after it, one or a few of the puppies were always the main focus, but their characters were altered radically from the film. Do you know how? They were given characters. Yeah, despite there being such powerful personalities in the first film, among them, the puppies the thing is named after aren't included in that list. Sure, a couple of them get names, Lucky, Patch, Rolly, and they'd all go on to be expanded on as characters in other media, but much like baby characters who aren't the main focus, the puppies are more of a prop and obstacle than they are their own. The fact that there are so many of them means Pongo and Purdy have to find interesting ways to sneak around Cruella, to get from place to place, to find food, etc. The amount of them contributes 
contributed significantly to the conflict, and that's all well and good. 101 Dalmatians had a focus and good characters and all that, but the puppies were neither of those, and that wasn't the intention. And even subsequent media that focuses on the puppies doesn't do so for all of them. In 101 Dalmatians 2, Patch is the main character, and the puppies again serve as a contributing factor to the conflict. 101 Dalmatians the series has three main puppies as the leads, but they go on mostly separate adventures almost always without the involvement of their siblings, of whom only three or so are given names and focus. My point is, the puppies have always been the most moldable aspect of the property, and Dalmatian Street takes better advantage of that factor than any before it. Theoretically speaking, 101 puppies means 101 individual identities, and while Dalmatian Street doesn't go that far, it'd be almost impossible if they attempted it, they still do a pretty good job within reason, having 20 fully personalized characters, including the main leads and parents, and in case you were wondering, the other 81 all have their own names that have been stated, and impressively, even with that in mind, they're all names starting with D. Again, really charming little details this show has. And the characters can be defined just the same. Going in, I didn't know what to expect from the concept, but for sure I thought I'd end up stumbling over all the characters and forget at least one. But no, each is so packed with their own personal flair that even now I can remember every single one. Starting with the main leads, there's Dolly and Dylan, the oldest siblings who are put in charge of the house while their parents are out at work, which is pretty much all the time. The show has a clearly indicated system for how everything works using visual storytelling and recurring themes, mostly in regards to ideas like trigger words, which rile all the pups up in a frenzy that they try to avoid, and each pup being designated to have certain responsibilities, so problems will arise when the equilibrium of the house gets thrown off, whether internally or because of an external force, and Dolly and Dylan usually have to deal with it. Individually, they have the tried and true relationship of siblings with opposing personalities. Dylan is a clean, responsible geek, Dolly is an energetic rebel, but as the series goes on, their character traits are expanded on, and by the end of the season, they've clearly gone through some developments. As leads, they also do the difficult job of bouncing off not only each other, but every other sibling they interact with, which explains why they start out with such basic archetypes to start. It works from the beginning because they've got enough individuality to have completely contrasting reactions to situations and therefore contrasting solutions, shown by how quite a few of the first episodes are about them clashing on how to do things, whereas later on, they spend more time agreeing with each other or collaborating ideas to make the best of both worlds. It shows a shift in dynamics subtly without ever explicitly stating as much, and I appreciate how smoothly they did that. They aren't the only important characters by a long shot though, as most of the named pups with unique designs get at least two episodes each focused solely on them, and I'm not going to be going nearly as in-depth on all of them as I did Dolly or Dylan, but I will give a brief description of what I think of their characters. For reference, this will be addressed in order of importance or screen time. Da Vinci, easy to describe based on their name, they're the artist and the most creative-minded of the group, contributing to some of the most experimental animation in the series, which gives her some points despite almost always being a background character. DJ, pretty self-explanatory, he does all the music, and there's a lot of jokes focused on him using sound cues. My thoughts on him coincide with his personality. Chill, he's one of the more passive in the series, but still leaves a pretty strong impression. Dorothy, since the oldest characters are established, it only makes sense that they do the same for the youngest, and she's a typical younger sibling, cute, but mostly used as a device for other stories, perfectly serviceable. Dizzy and Dee Dee, a package of two hyper gullible pups with a mischievous streak. They mostly take after Dolly and sort of serve as a representation for all the pups left as part of the collective in the series. Next to Dorothy, they're probably the youngest, usually serving as the main lead's indicators for when morals are becoming questionable, and in that regard, they do a fine job for what they are. Delgado, notable for being a bipedal dog with wheels to supplement back legs. Another one who gets along with Dolly, he's enthusiastic and fast, mostly chiming in on episodes having to do with extreme sports. One of the greater examples for how the show uses a multitude of body types for their characters, despite being dogs of the same breed. He isn't all that complex, but he's still fun nonetheless. Dimitri 1 through 3, a group of triplets all with the same name and a different number. They kind of blend into one another in that they're rude troublemakers, and that's my choice. Though I do like seeing the small additions given to each of them to diversify their designs. Deepak, now this guy's appearance tells a story. He's a literal yin-yang made to be symmetrical. The most zen out of everyone in the house, his main deal has to do with calming others down, while also being on edge most of the time himself due to the antics of his siblings. He also has a distinguishing trait of really liking cats to the point of obsession. I'm not entirely sure why, but I always enjoy characters that try to be calm who are constantly thrown off their rocker. It makes for good situational laughter. Diesel, a dog representing the most innate desires of man, digging huge ass holes. He's not the brightest bulb in the drawer, but he knows what he wants, and I respect that. Keep fighting the good fight, Diesel. One day you'll dig through water. Delilah and Doug, the parents. They try to give love to their kids whenever possible, but they spend a lot of time on their own job, so they trust Dylan and Dolly to run the house when they're away. In the times they are on screen, they're also a likable duo of opposites, one composed, the other goofy, but they're a nice couple, and I quite enjoy them. Destiny, Dallas, and Deja Vu. Consider the three divas of the family, they're also the 
canonical reason the characters are able to live in a house without an owner. The three of them are actors and social media influencers who make the money needed to keep the family from ever worrying about needing it. And that's a clever explanation for how the Dalmatians stay afloat when they destroy the house almost every episode. Now as far as characterization, I'm not gonna pick favorites, but it's deja vu. She's the, the best of the three. While Dallas and Destiny are written to kind of phase into one another, having several jokes about lacking individualism, Deja Vu is just... She just does whatever. You know, she isn't as pratty or full of herself as the others, just sort of in her own world. And she's the one who most often gets the best moments when the three of them are split up. Dawkins. Inventor and Dylan's on and off again sidekick, he's incredibly analytical, the resident nerd, and often fills in as the substitute substitute leader when Dolly and Dylan go off on their own adventures to the point there was a whole episode focused around it because the show likes to make fun of its own tropes. A little more one note than most of the cast, but not bad at all. And then there's Dante. He might not technically be the most important or have the most screen time in comparison to the other characters mentioned, but I saved him for last because, you know, he's my favorite. Being an obvious reference to the main character from Dante's Inferno, they even name an episode exactly that at one point, he's constantly bemoaning about the end of the world in any mundane scenario. That might sound kind of basic in concept, but on the contrary, he keeps the routine fresh across his appearances and always provides just the right tone to shake things up or catch you off guard. I'm also intrigued by his design since it's technically impossible. You know, there's always that question of whether zebras are black with white stripes or white with black stripes? There's a known answer, but I'll let you figure that out. Well, that's not the case for Dalmatians, because when they're born, they're always completely white and get their spots a few months after birth. That's not a slight against the show, though. I love the contrast and think it's pretty funny. He's great, and I'm glad he got a bit more focus placed on him than some of the other characters, but that leads into something else I'd like to mention. Though the series will obviously have episodes mainly focused on singular pups, that doesn't mean that the rest of the family isn't there. Even if they don't play a major role most of the time, a lot of the cast will get in a few lines or help with smaller bits or B-plots whenever possible, and that decision leads to the world feeling much more alive. In some shows, the side cast can feel a little bit two-dimensional, feeling more like props waiting in the wings for the heroes to interact with, but since the entire focus of Dalmatian Street is the pops and what they're doing, these guys are all busy with their own things when the main characters aren't on screen, and that distinction helps it stick out a lot among the franchise. Even the dogs with generic designs that act as a collective most of the time are usually off being independent in the background, which not everyone is gonna notice, but for those who do, it adds character. And boy, does this show know how to do that for the ensemble cast outside of the puppies. I'm not talking about the other animal characters either though. What I'm referring to are the humans, and more specifically, spoilers for the series, skip to here if you want to experience it for yourself, the DeVille family, mainly headed by the great nephew of Cruella, Hunter. He's very much a less ruthless version of her in most aspects, but that isn't from a lack of trying or an effort to tone down her kind of villainy for TV. Rather, Hunter's intentionally displayed to be more of a kid in his approach to pulling schemes in order to show his innocence in comparison to someone like his great aunt as well as making it clear he's far more redeemable as a kid trying to find someone who cares about him. His big redemption, as it were, comes in the season finale when Cruella comes back to try finishing the job from 60 years ago, and god, it is amazing. I've always had a certain philosophy when it comes to a character like Cruella. The bigger, the better. I like the 90s cartoon fine enough, but they went in the exact wrong direction with the character. She doesn't even try to actively hunt out the puppies in that one. She's more interested in getting the owner's farm and being into big business. I still like her fine enough, but god, she might as well been a completely different character. Then you look at the live action remake of 101 with Glenn Close, now that's how you do Cruella. More ruthless, more insane, more terrifying. That's the way to go. Same with the directed DVD sequel where she tries to make the puppies into a goddamn art piece using their coats as the canvas. That is delightfully devilish, pun intended. And this might be my favorite depiction of the character yet. You think for the TV version they're gonna tone down Cruella's actions or not make him as serious? Nope, no puns about her trying to turn the puppies into an accessory now, only, oh, yeah, that's uh, that, that's Cruella DeVille. She wants to murder us and wear us like objects. There's a puppy murderizing machine for a demonstration. Like Dolly and Dylan's reaction here, that's the audience knowing the crew didn't pull any punches, and I respect them so much for it. Cruella also really leans into the scarier parts of her personality, completely reveling in her own evil deeds and turning into a straight up slasher villain. Yes, I love everything about this. Her mannerisms, her warlike tactics for trying to capture Dalmatians, the way she's constantly spraying herself with acidic de-aging formula, the way she goddamn walks. It's all so perfect and feels like a natural continuation of the character into insanity. She's not just after any Dalmatian coat anymore, she's specifically after the descendants of the dogs that ruined her plan 60 years ago and has specially trained her great nephew to understand dog for the purpose of tracking them down. Plus, with how the show's built up a generally lighthearted tone and focus more on the puppies' personalities and relationships, the fact she's trying to kill them all holds a ton more weight to it. 
If the series doesn't get picked up for a second season, that's where everything will end. And while I can't say that if it ended here, the crew didn't at least give us some form of closure, I can't say I'd be fully satisfied either. The truth is, we don't have that many shows like Dalmatian Street around, with such a creative premise and reworking of a classic property into something new and worth preserving. It's got so many unique qualities worthy of being remembered for, and in the brief time it was given space on the Disney Channel UK YouTube, the views reflected that, ranging from 4 to almost 8 million views apiece. Compare that to a show like Randy Cunningham, a series on Disney XD that did get a second season, and its YouTube numbers don't even compare. So a lack of interest isn't the problem, but like I said, a lack of advertising and opportunity. This is a series that, with all the characters it's set up, all the world building it's done, all the effort that went into the designs, the characters, the great rigged animation, it should have at least two seasons to flesh it out. 47 segments is still good, don't get me wrong, but I wholeheartedly believe the series deserves more than that for all the effort and passion clearly involved. Again, I don't know for sure if it's possible for a second season season to come, but I still think there is even the smallest chance. It hasn't been too long since it stopped airing in America, and though by now it's been out for a while, there have been some far crazier comebacks I've seen. So if you can, watch it on Disney+, Plus, talk about it, make your own videos, whatever, and if a second season still doesn't come after that, at least you'll have a new show to like and look back on. And yet, and yet I wonder.